welcome to Frig Friday, featuring Sigrid Unset's Kristen Lovren's Daughter, read by Michelle Hammond, sponsored by Gal's Guide. Kristen Lovren's Daughter by Sigrid Unset Winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature Book One The Wreath Part Three Lovrens Bjorgolfsson Chapter Four The frost hung on. In every stable of the village the starving animals lowed and complained, suffering from the cold. But the people were already rationing the fodder as best they could. There was not much visiting done during the Christmas season that year. Everyone was staying at home. At Christmas the cold grew worse. Each day felt colder than the one before. People could hardly remember such a harsh winter. And while no more snow fell, even up in the mountains, the snow that had fallen on St. Clement's Day froze as hard as stone. The sun shone in a clear sky now that the days were growing lighter. At night the northern lights flickered and sputtered above the mountain ridges to the north. They flickered over half the sky, but they didn't bring a change in the weather. Once in a while it would cloud over, sprinkling a little dry snow, but then the clear skies and biting cold would return. The log murmured and gurgled lazily beneath the bridges of ice. Each morning Kristen would think that now she could stand it no longer, that she wouldn't be able to make it through the day, because each day felt like a duel between her father and herself. And was it right for them to be so at odds with each other right now, when every living thing, every person and beast in the valleys was enduring a common trial? But when evening came, she had made it through after all. It was not that her father was unfriendly. They never spoke of what lay between them, but Kristen could feel that in everything he left unsaid, he was steadfastly determined to stand by his refusal, and she burned with longing for his affection. Her anguish was even greater because she knew how much else her father had to bear, and if things had been as they were before, he would have talked to her about his concerns. It's true that at Jurengard they were better prepared than most other places. But even here they felt the effects of the bad year, every day and every hour. In the winter Lovrens usually spent time breaking and training his foals, but this year, during the autumn, he had sold all of them in the south. His daughter missed hearing his voice out in the courtyard and watching him tussle with the lanky, shaggy two-year-old horses in the game that he loved so much. The storerooms, barns, and bins on the farm had not been emptied after the harvest of the previous year, but many people came to Jurengard asking for help, either as a purchase or a gift, and no one asked in vain. Late one evening, a very old man, dressed in furs, arrived on skis. Lavren spoke to him out in the courtyard, and Halvden took food to him in the hearthroom. No one on the farm who had seen him knew who he was, but it was assumed that he was one of the people who lived in the mountains. Perhaps Lovrens had run into him out there. But Kristen's father didn't speak of the visit, nor did Halvden. Then one evening a man arrived with whom Lovrens Bjorgolfsson had had a score to settle for many years. Lovrens went out to the storeroom with him, but when he returned to the house, he said, Everyone wants me to help them. And yet here on my farm you're all against me. Even you, wife, he said angrily to Ronfred. Then Ronfred lashed out at Kristen. Do you hear what your father is saying to me? I'm not against you, Lovrens. You know full well, Kristen, what happened south of here at Rolstad late in the fall, when he traveled through the valley in the company of that other whoremonger, his kinsman from Haugen. She took her own life, that unfortunate woman he had enticed away from all her kinsmen. Her face rigid, Kristen replied harshly, I see that you blame him as much for the years when he was striving to get out of sin as for those when he was living in it. Jesus, Maria, cried Ronfred, clasping her hands together. Look what's become of you. Won't even this make you change your mind? 
No, said Kristen. I haven't changed my mind. Then Lovrens looked up from the bench where he was sitting with Ulfield. Nor have I, Kristen, he said quietly. But Kristen knew in her heart that in some way she had changed, if not her decision, then her outlook. She had received word of the progress of that ill-fated journey. It had gone easier than anyone could have expected. Whether it was because the cold had settled in his wound, or for some other reason, the knife injury which Erland had received in his chest had become infected. He lay ill at the hostel in Roldstad for a long time, and Herr Björn tended to him during those days. But because Erland had been wounded, it was easier to explain everything else and to make others believe them. When he was able to continue, he transported the dead woman in a coffin all the way to Oslo. There, with Siri Jon's intervention, he found a gravesite for her in the cemetery of Nikolaus Church, which lay in ruins. Then he had confessed to the Bishop of Oslo himself, who had enjoined him to travel to the Shrine of the Holy Blood in Schwerin, so now he had left the country. There was no place to which she could make a pilgrimage to seek redemption. Her lot was to stay here, to wait and worry, and try to endure her opposition to her parents. A strange cold winter light fell over all her memories of her meetings with Erland. She thought about his ardor, in love and in sorrow, and it occurred to her that if she had been able to seize on all things with equal abruptness and plunge ahead at once, then afterward they might seem of less consequence and easier to bear. Sometimes she thought that Erland might give her up. She had always had a slight fear that it would become too difficult for them, and he would lose heart. But she would not give him up, not unless he released her from all promises. And so the winter wore on, and Kristen could no longer fool herself. She had to admit that now the most difficult trial awaited all of them, for Ulfhild did not have long to live. And in the midst of her bitter sorrow over her sister, Kristen realized with horror that her own soul had been led astray and was corrupted by sin. For as she witnessed the dying child and her parents' unspeakable grief, she thought of only one thing. If Ulfhild dies, how will I be able to endure facing my father without throwing myself down before him to confess everything and to beg him to forgive me and to do with me what he will? The Lenten fast was upon them. People were slaughtering the small animals they had hoped to save before the livestock perished on its own, and people were falling ill from living on fish and the scant and wretched portions of grain. Sira Eirik released the entire village from the ban against consuming milk, but no one had even a drop of milk. Ulfield was confined to bed. She slept alone in the sister's bed, and someone watched over her every night. Sometimes Kristen and her father would both sit with her. On one such night, Lavrin said to his daughter, Do you remember what Brother Edvin said about Ulfield's fate? I thought at the time that maybe this was what he meant, but I put it out of my mind. During those nights, he would occasionally talk about one thing or another from the time when the children were small. Kristen would sit there, pale and miserable, understanding that behind his words, her father was pleading with her. One day, Lovrens had gone out with Kolbein to seek out a bear's lair in the mountains forest in the north. They returned home with a female bear on a sled, and Lovrens was carrying a little bear cub, still alive, inside his tunic. Ulfield smiled a little when he showed it to her, but Ronfred said that this was no time to take in that kind of animal, and what was he going to do with it now? I'm going to fatten it up and then tie it to the bedchamber of my maidens, said Lovrens, laughing harshly. But they couldn't find the kind of rich milk that the bear cub needed, and so several days later, Lovrens killed it. The sun had grown so strong that occasionally, in the middle of the day, the eaves would begin to drip. The titmice clung to the timbered walls and hopped around on the sunny side. The pecking of their beaks resounded as they looked for flies asleep in the gaps between the wood. Out across the meadows the sun gleamed, hard and shiny like silver. Finally, one evening, clouds began to gather in front of the moon. 
In the morning, they woke up at Urengard to a whirl of snow that blocked their view in all directions. On that day, it became clear that Ulfield was going to die. The entire household had gathered inside, and Sarah Eirik had come. Many candles were burning in the room. Early that evening, Ulfield passed on, calmly and peacefully, in her mother's arms. Ronfred bore it better than anyone could have expected. The parents sat together, both of them weeping softly. Everyone in the room was crying. When Kristen went over to her father, he put his arm around her shoulders. He noticed how she was trembling and shaking, and then he pulled her close. But it seemed to her that he must have felt as if she had been snatched farther away from him than her dead little sister in the bed. She didn't know how she had managed to endure. She hardly remembered why she was enduring, but, lethargic and mute with pain, she managed to stay on her feet and did not collapse. Then a couple of planks were pulled up in the floor in front of the altar of St. Thomas, and a grave was dug in the rock-hard earth underneath for Ulfield Lovren's daughter. It snowed heavily and silently for all those days the child lay on the straw bier. It was snowing as she was laid in the earth, and it continued to snow, almost without stop, for an entire month. For those who were waiting for the redemption of spring, it seemed as if it would never come. The days grew long and bright, and the valley lay in a haze of thawing snow while the sun shone. But frost was still in the air, and the heat had no power. At night it froze hard. Great cracking sounds came from the ice. A rumbling issued from the mountains, and the wolves howled and the foxes yipped as if it were midwinter. People scraped off bark for the livestock, but they were perishing by the dozens in their stalls. No one knew when it would end. Kristen went out on such a day, when the water was trickling in the furrows of the road, and the snow glistened like silver across the fields. Facing the sun, the snowdrifts had become hollowed out, so that the delicate ice lattice of the crusted snow broke with the gentle ring of silver when she pressed her foot against it. But wherever there was the slightest shadow, the air was sharp with frost and the snow was hard. She walked up toward the church. She didn't know why she was going there, but she felt drawn to it. Her father was there. Several farmers, guild brothers, were holding a meeting in the gallery. That much she knew. Up on the hill she met the group of farmers as they were leaving. Sarah Eirik was with them. The men were all on foot, walking in a dark, fur-wrapped cluster, nodding and talking to each other. They returned her greeting in a surly manner as she passed. Kristen thought to herself that it had been a long time since everyone in the village had been her friend. Everyone no doubt knew that she was a bad daughter. Perhaps they knew even more about her. Now they probably all thought that there must have been some truth to the old gossip about her and Arna and Bentine. Perhaps she was in terrible disrepute. She lifted her chin and walked on toward the church. The door stood ajar. It was cold inside the church, and yet a certain warmth streamed toward her from this dim brown room, with the tall columns soaring upward, lifting the darkness up toward the crossbeams of the roof. There were no lit candles on the altars, but a little sunshine came in through the open door, casting a faint light on the paintings and vessels. Up near the St. Thomas altar, she saw her father on his knees with his head resting on his folded hands, which were clutching his cap against his chest. Shy and dispirited, Kristen tiptoed out and stood on the gallery. Framed by the arch of two small pillars, which she held on to, she saw Jurengard lying below, and beyond her home, the pale blue haze over the valley. In the sun, the river glinted white with water and ice all through the village. But the alder thicket along its bank was golden brown with blossoms, the spruce forest was spring green even up by the church, and tiny birds chittered and chirped and trilled in the grove nearby. Oh yes, she had heard birdsong like that every evening after the sunset. And now she felt the longing that she thought had been wrung out of her, the longing in her body and in her blood, 
It began to stir now, feeble and faint, as if it were waking up from a winter's hibernation. Lavren Spjorgelsen came outside and closed the church door behind him. He went over and stood near his daughter, looking out from the next arch. She noticed how the winter had ravaged her father. She didn't think that she could bring this up now, but it tumbled out of her all the same. Is it true what Mother said the other day, that you told her, if it had been Arne Geardsen, then you would have relented? Yes, said Lovrens without looking at her. You never said that while Arna was alive, replied Kristen. It was never discussed. I could see that the boy was fond of you, but he said nothing, and he was young. And I never noticed that you thought of him in that way. You couldn't expect me to offer my daughter to a man who owned no property. He smiled fleetingly. But I was fond of the boy, he said softly. And if I had seen that you were pining with love for him... They remained standing there, staring straight ahead. Kristen sensed her father looking at her. She struggled to keep her expression calm, but she could feel how pale she was. Then her father came over to her, put both arms around her, and hugged her tight. He tilted her head back, looked into his daughter's face, and then hid it against his shoulder. Jesus Christus, little Kristen, are you so unhappy? I think I'm going to die from it, father, she said against his chest. She burst into tears, but she was crying because she had felt in his caress and seen in his eyes that now he was so worn out with anguish that he could no longer hold on to his opposition. She had won. In the middle of the night, she woke up when her father touched her shoulder in the dark. Get up he said quietly. Do you hear it? Then she heard the singing at the corners of the house, the deep, full tone of the moisture-laden south wind. Water was streaming off the roof, and the rain whispered as it fell on soft, melting snow. Kristen threw on a dress and followed her father to the outer door. Together they stood and looked out into the bright May night, Warm wind and rain swept toward them. The sky was a heap of tangled, surging rain clouds. There was a seething from the woods, a whistling between the buildings, and up on the mountains they heard the hollow rumble of snow sliding down. Kristen reached for her father's hand and held it. He had called her and wanted to show her this. It was the kind of thing he would have done in the past, before things changed between them, and now he was doing it again. When they went back inside to lie down, Lovren said, The stranger who was here this week carried a letter to me from Sir Moonon Bardson. He intends to come here this summer to visit his mother, and he asked whether he might seek me out and speak with me. How will you answer him, my father? she whispered. I can't tell you that now, replied Lovren but I will speak to him, and then I must act in such a way that I can answer for myself before God, my daughter. Kristen crawled into bed beside Romborg, and Lovrens went over and lay down next to his sleeping wife. He lay there thinking that if the floodwaters rose high and suddenly, then few farms in the village would be as vulnerable as Jurengard. There was supposed to be a prophecy about it, that one day the river would take the farm. <laughs>